Oh Lord, we are going to have trouble with your word today. We pray that you help us avoid the arrogance that leads us to dismiss these words as irrelevant or outdated. And keep us from using these words as a weapon. Help us to hear what will bring life. Keep us on that path by your word and spirit. Amen. We're continuing to talk about the theme of abundance. And the theme today being the stewardship, uh, the, the abundance of stewardship, which generally is a catchword for we need to prepare for our budget for next year. Let's talk about money. The good news is, is I'm not going to talk about money today. At least not directly in that way. We're reading three different passages that have something to say about God's abundance and our faithfulness. So I'll start with Deuteronomy, move to John, and then go to Acts. I'm reading from Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. God speaks these as a command. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. And then from the Gospel of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray Jesus, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept a common purse and used to steal what was in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You do not always have me. And then finally, from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership over any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as them owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what were sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to, tomb, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. When I was thinking about the prayer for illumination this week, I realized looking at those passages, how could we not have trouble with this word? To each according to their need, most people think that sounds like Karl Marx. You might have heard that fellow before. They held everything in common. 
No one had any need, and yet you have that passage stuck alongside this passage where Jesus is like, there's always going to be poor people around. Or that's not exactly what he said, but it's usually how the church likes to interpret it. I want to start by taking about this idea of abundance. We've been playing around with this. We live in a time that talks about scarcity, scarcity in everything. What does it mean to talk about abundance? And the only way to do that really is to say, start with what you have. Start there. It led to the miracle feeding stories when they only had a couple of fish and bread and the next thing you know, thousands of people were fed. What it turns out was people had learned actually how to share with one another. That's the miracle. There's a story recently of a church, I think, in the Chicago area, that the church received a significant bequest. And this church of about 300 or so folks decided that instead of investing this money in an endowment or in a community project, that they actually gave every member of the congregation $500 and said, do some good with this for the kingdom of God. You decide. And they let it go. And I think to myself, wow, we can talk about how irresponsible that is. Somebody might lose that money. And in fact, they did. There were stories where the money didn't work out the way that folks expected it. No one took the money and pocketed it, at least that they said, but they turned around and, and multiplied it by giving it away. They already had a sizable endowment. They already had their budget taken care of. This was out of their abundance. They didn't need it. For some possible thing in the future, they decided that they could give it some people started community projects and did all sorts of interesting things, but it's an example of some radical ways that we might be called to share our own abundance in our lives, not just financially. Because there were a couple of folks in that congregation who got that $500 and used it to keep from having their electric shut off. And someone said, well, what? Well, wait a minute. And the pastor said, of course, they needed that. That was community ministry. So where is our abundance? Where is it that we're being called to spend a year's worth of money? You know, that's what the pound of perfume costs. The denarii that Je Judas talks about was the amount of money most of the folks then would have made in an entire year's worth of work. And there in the midst, she wastes it, wiping it on Jesus' feet. And that line, the poor will always be with you. The church has often thrown that around to say, well, there's only so much we can do. Usually when we start talking about issues of justice and poverty and inequality, people go, whoa, 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 Jesus said the poor will always be with you. You're not going to be able to get rid of poverty. But the problem is, is that's not exactly how the construction in the Greek works. What Jesus is saying is, you as my followers will always have poor in your midst. You will be with the poor. Because that is where we are called to be always. It was about location, not about social condition. They'll know you because you'll be hanging out with the poor and the excluded in any society. That's where you will be. That's where my followers will be. So this moment of extravagance wasn't about ignoring the poor. As we know full well, Judas was really not interested in the poor, but enriching himself. I wonder the next time someone says, well, Jesus said the poor will be with you, if it often says more about their condition than the reality of what Jesus had to say. So I think there's three things that we can talk about, and this sermon will be relatively short. The first one is that that I already know. The second one is when Jesus, or when the, when the commandment comes in Deuteronomy. I'm going to try to tie these three passages together, even though they sound like they're not. So the first one is the poor you will always have in your midst. The other one was is that you were a slave in Egypt. And then the last one is there was not a needy person among them. Those three things tie these passages together. I've talked about the poor being with us, the responsibility of the believers of Jesus Christ to be in the places not of power, but in the places that lack. 
traditional senses of power, because we know the people united have a whole, whole lot of power. But this line in here, where God commands, God starts with this language that, or ends with this commandment, and said, you were slaves in Egypt, and as a result, you are not going to take every, lit, every last bit of the harvest of all of your resources and keep it for yourself. You're supposed to give it away, not in any sort of program. Do you know how inefficient it would have been to just leave it out there? They didn't bring it in and create a program. They just let it go. It's a reminder that when the people of Israel come into the inheritance of the land, that they're at risk of imitating what life was like when they were in Egypt. Now, the words are spoken to people who were never slaves. Not once. We know that the folks who actually made it eat finally into the promised land, none of them had been in slavery. And yet, all the time, the language is, you were a slave in Egypt, which reminds all of us and those who are brought into this story through Jesus Christ that we too, that that is our story. That that is our story. And if we hold up that story, it reminds us that we better make sure that we're not replicating the ways of Pharaoh. That's why the Lord says, I'm commanding you to do this. There's no wiggle room in this. And in good Presbyterian order, you know, in our book of order, our book of our, 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 our constitution, at any time the word shall shows up, by the way, means that it's not open for debate. It's not open for change. You shall do this. And here we have it. You shall share. And yet we struggle with that repeatedly. And then the last one was, there was not a needy person among them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living in a society where there's not a needy person among them? We take it for granted. We take it for granted. Now, many of you all know that I grew up in Indiana. I did grow up in Indianapolis, and those of us who are from Indianapolis like to say we're from Indianapolis and not Indiana. I don't know if St. Louisans know anything about that. <laughs> so, but there was a fellow who I grew up listening to who I thought, this guy's just a farmer. He's from down south in Indiana, I don't really want anything to do with him. And as I've gotten older, I've become a bigger fan of John Mellencamp. And I heard an interview with him this week. And they were asking him why he didn't live in New York. And he said, I can't handle it. Now, y'all get used to this. You, you see homeless people on the street. You see, you know, folks in these huge towers right next to folks who are struggling to just survive. And he said, y'all just keep walking. He goes, I can't handle it. It destroys my soul. So he's living in a farm in the middle of nowhere in southern Indiana. Now, I'm not suggesting that's what we do. What I'm saying is, is that we can become anesthetized to the mess around us. We just keep putting up with it. And then we forget. And that's the line. We've got to stop forgetting. Because if we remember that that story, where God says no to the ways of Pharaoh, to exploitive labor, that's really what the story of Exodus is all about. I've said it before, Pharaoh was so interested in maintaining his empire that he was willing to sacrifice his firstborn children and the economy to try to keep cheap labor. You know, the whole issue, the whole issue in Egypt was really about taking a day off. One day. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, we want to go out into the wilderness to worship God. And Pharaoh says, y'all are lazy. Y'all all are lazy. And so he raises the quota on them. Pharaoh didn't care what the living conditions of the people. All he cared about was how many big monuments he could build on their backs. And the end of that kind of society is the end of all societies built like that. They come crashing down. There was not a needy person among them. And this is the piece where it brings it home for us. Because we can talk about large societal issues and quickly become despair. Because there's not many of us who can change public policy. We can make a difference in our own communities, and our own local politics. Never, never, ever forget that. But on the national stage, most of us in this room have no real power over those kinds of things. 
And so this is the piece here that brings it home for us. There was not a needy person among them. What the early Christians understood is they were not about to overturn the Roman Empire, but they could be an alternative, a small glimpse of life and sharing in the midst of a society of death. So they came together. People sold fields, which means in that community there were some wealthy folks. There were fields and houses and houses and things being sold so that in those communities all would be welcome. The story of abundance is not about being foolish with what we have. It's about recognizing that what we have really isn't even ours. And that our needs and wants have gotten all messed up in our modern society. The idea of stewardship is about saving the stuff that we really don't need so that someone who is in need can have. It is that simple. It really is that simple. Any society that does not learn to share, any society that figures out that hoarding is the way to go, will come collapsing down. We know it. We feel it. Fear and anxiety reign out. And at the end of the day, abundance and stewardship is about dealing with injustice. When some have too much and others don't have enough. I could talk about public policy. I could talk about the structure of policing that leads to the mess that we have. I could talk about the North County courts that are in position of only doing one thing, which is making sure that they mail their budgets on the backs of the poor. We can talk about those things, but we've known that for a long time. What we do in here, what Christians do when they gather, is preparing us to live differently in a world that does not care. And we'll back it up with all the tanks and guns they possibly can. That's the truth. Pharaoh wasted his entire army in the Red Sea trying to get back cheap labor. That's the story of our faith. So what do we do in the face of that? Do we despair? Do we turn inward? Do we ignore what's going on? No, we name it. We own it. And then we remember that we too were slaves. So that we don't continue to act like it. So that we don't replicate the ways of faith. And that we will never, ever forget, wherever the poor, the widow, the excluded, the orphan, whoever is not at the center of things, is where we, as a people of faith, ought to go. It starts right here, but it does not end here. What we do is model the dis disciplines of our faith right here, and then go out and live in the world, as if it already has changed.